Reverend Winnie continues her series based on Deepak Chopra's Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, and this week talks about the Law of Detachment. She also explores the definition of success as the continued expansion of happiness and the progressive realization of worthy goals. In this talk, Reverend Wendy explains that detachment is not that you should own nothing, but that nothing should ever own you. So we have been exploring together for quite a few weeks now Deepak Chopra's book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. And I want to do a really quick review. We're in week number six now, so this is our second to the last. But here's what we've been exploring together. The first week we studied the law of pure potentiality. The law of pure potentiality. The fact that everything that's manifest has come out of the field of the un it undifferentiated whole. That everything that's manifest came out of a field of all that is possible. And how important it is for us when we are exploring this idea of creating a life of greater meaning and greater success, that we tap into this field of pure potentiality, that we live and move and have our being in an infinite field of possibility. The second law we looked at was the law of giving. And it was important for us to remember that it is not just the law of giving, it is the law of giving and receiving. That we know that when we give our out breath, that we cannot stop there, we must breathe back in, right? That the in breath is no more important than the out breath or vice versa. Much the same way this is a universe of reciprocity that we want to give and we want to and need to practice receiving, that it is a very fluid cycle. The third law that we looked at was the law of karma or the law of cause and effect, and that it is in fact extremely important for us when working with this law that we don't beat ourselves up with this law when we find ourselves in situations in our lives that we do not like, that we don't go around, what did I do to create that? That's not the intention behind the law of karma or the law of cause and effect. It is for us to be mindful, though, to plant the kinds of seeds in our life that we do want to sow, to recognize that there is a relationship between what's going on inside of our mind, our heart, and our soul, and what begins to show up in our life experience. And that it is, in fact, very important for us to take notice of what consistently, consistently shows up in our life and stays in our life because it is a mirror reflecting to us something within us that is allowing that situation to arise and to continue to exist. And when we get that, we are at a place of power because there we can begin to make the changes that we want to make. We looked at the law of least effort, and I have to be honest with you, this is one of my favorite spiritual laws. I don't know how it is for you, and I'm not sure if it's a result of living a certain number of years in one's life, but I've gotten a little bit, of t a little bit tired of trying to make everything happen in my life that I'd like to have happen in my life. Raise your hand if you relate to that at all. A lot of us do. I like the idea and I know that it is more than an idea, it's a way of being. This law of least effort. Not a law of no effort, <laughs> but a law of least effort. It reminds me to realize that within me really is all that I need and that there is a way to move in my life with greater grace, with greater ease, that I don't have to effort to be that which I already am, that I can flow with that. There's an expression or a term in Buddhism, wu wei, which means least effort, effortless effort. And so to move towards the things that we want to create in our lives, Efforting with the least amount of effort is absolutely delicious to me. To you too? Yes? All right. So the law of least effort. Then last week, we looked at the law of intention and desire. And I like this one too. I love creating. Do you like to create? 
Yes, some of you do, some of you are quiet. I love to create. We are all very creative. I will never forget my minister, Reverend Robert Stevens, who used to say, everybody is incredibly creative. Even if you don't think that you are, you are. Some people are just very creative, at crea very talented at creating drama in their lives. <laughs> Some are very talented in creating messes and problems in their lives. But we are all incredibly creative. The law of intention and desire is about creating. It's, it, it is about creating. And it's about understanding that deep in the idea of desire, it means of the Father of the Father, of Spirit. Emily Cady, the author of Lessons and Truth, said that desire is God tapping at the door of your consciousness with greater good. And how we want to actually look beneath the things that we think we desire, that we want, and try to understand what those things represent to us, what experience or quality they represent, because it is really that that we desire even more than whatever the thing might be. So the law of intention and desire. And I think it's very interesting the way Deepak has organized these or sequenced these because the very next one following the law of intention and desire is the law of detachment. <laughs> now does that not seem like a contradiction right there, right? You know, desire and intention, detachment. What do you do with that? And I had to chuckle as I was looking over my notes this week because I had written in my notes that I thought it was quite interesting that I was preparing this lesson on Election Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, early in the morning. Tuesday morning is my lesson writing time. Little did I know when I was putting this together how much I personally would be needing to practice the law of detachment. I know some were practicing celebration and I'm happy for those who were celebrating, experiencing celebration. I was having to practice the law of detachment. What is the law of detachment? Sometimes we misunderstand what it is. Sometimes when people go into spiritual practice, they don't go in deep enough and think through things enough or educate themselves enough. And I've seen some approach this idea of detachment almost in a way of disconnecting with life, that nothing matters anymore. And sometimes I've even seen them turn their back on, on people in their lives or whole experiences of their lives saying, I am just spiritually awakening and I detach from everything. That's not what detachment is. That's not what detachment is. Detachment as taught by the Buddha is, has more to do with being fully alive in the moment, fully alive in the moment, without any story, and without being hooked by what is happening in the moment. I think even more powerful a term than the term attachment is the term or the idea of being hooked. And so what detachment is about is not being hooked into really anything in our lives, not being addicted to it or pushing it away, being able to embrace and hold all of life with fluidity, with, with detachment, with the idea that I completely understand that everything is impermanent. And therefore, I will not hook myself or allow myself to be hooked by whatever is happening. I can experience it fully and allow it to move through me, the good, the bad, and everything in between. It's very much like what I think is, the message is contained here in these lines from the Upanishad. Like two golden birds perched on the self-same tree, intimate friends, the ego and the self, self with a capital S, dwell in the same body. The former, the ego, eats the sweet and sour fruits of the tree of life, while the latter looks on in detachment. It is 
that there is a part in us, the ego, that identifies with and can see and can name and label and oftentimes is attached to, addicted to, or repulsed by the sweet and the sour of life and rises and falls with that. And there is that in us, the self with a capital S, the spiritual self that is the witness, that is the witness, that can see all and be fully present with all as it arises and not be hooked and not be attached. You see, the law of detachment is not about disconnecting from life and what we love and care about, but it's knowing that there is a healthy way to connect and love and care, and there is an unhealthy way to connect and love and care. Attachment is a little bit like, or can be like, an addiction. Attachment binds us to and almost controls us to that which we have attached to. We can have a preference, and this is where the law of intention and desire is not in competition with the law of detachment. We can have a preference for things to be a certain way. That's what our intentions and desires are about, right? We prefer a certain something in our life, a certain situation in our life, a certain thing in our life, a certain way of being in our life. But we can also be okay with it not happening as we had planned or has, as we had thought. Deepak writes that action without attachment to the outcome is the secret for a life without stress. Boy, is that true. Think about that. Action, doing what is yours to do, effortless effort, action without attachment to the outcome is the secret for a life without stress. So it's not that we stop doing, it's not that we stop acting, it's not that we stop preferring, but we are not attached to the outcome. We know that in an infinite field of possibilities, there are many different outcomes possible, and there are many different ways to get from point A to point B. When he talks about the things that we might want in our life, he says that much of the time we are chasing after the symbol when it's really the thing beneath the symbol that our soul is desiring. The Dalai Lama said most of our troubles are due to our passionate desire for and attachment to things that we misapprehend as enduring entities. Let me repeat that. Most of our troubles are due to our passionate desire for and attachment to things that we misapprehend as enduring entities. So when there is something within the field of your intentions and desires that you would like, by all means pursue it. Pursue it as a strong preference. Pursue it without getting hooked into it. Pursue it with joy, be open to it unfolding in many different ways, and be willing to look beneath the symbol and to try to find out for yourself what is it beneath that that I am really wanting? Is it really that physical thing or is it what that physical thing represents to me? Does that physical thing represent to me a life of maybe a little more ease and comfort? Then is it that thing that you're really wanting? Or is it the ease and comfort you're really wanting? Right? When we get what it is that we're really wanting, what we're really preferring, the power in that is then as we pursue the thing, the physical form of that that we would like, we don't pursue it with a sense of attachment. And we also are able to pursue it realizing that that thing or other things like that thing could also allow us to experience the feeling 
that that thing represents. Are you with me on that? That is so important. And it's important because it begins to help us loosen our tight, what tends to be a tight grip of trying to control everything. It helps us to loosen that and to give God, life, the universe, whatever we want to call it, the opportunity to move through us and help us achieve or attract whatever that thing is and what that thing represents without being addicted to it happening or attached to it happening in a specific way. I shared this quote this morning. I can't remember now. Actually, I think I can remember if I look at my notes. Detachment is not that you should own nothing, but that nothing should own you. By Ali Talib. Or this one, I love this Zen proverb. This really fit with the song you just sang. Let go or be dragged. (laughs) Oh my God, I've got to tell you an image I just had. John, are you in the room? No, he's not in the room. Years, boy, do I know that feeling and physically in my body. So I was in ministerial school and one of my classmates was an avid um, water skier and invited John and myself to go out on one of the lakes near ministerial school to go skiing, water skiing with him. Now, I thought it should come somewhat naturally to me because I do snow ski and I'm a decent ice skater. So I thought, okay, you know, water, this water is melted, but just stand up on it on this thing called a ski. And I will never forget Gary Simmons saying to me, you've got to get your weight up over the the ski as the boat's taking off so you can stand up. Well, I couldn't get my body up, and I would not let go. (laughs) Do you know how hard water is? And I did not do that just once. I did it three times. And I never got up on the skis and I never let go, (laughs) boom, 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 as the boat's going. When I finally did let go, it was because I was exhausted. I could not walk the next day, nor could I sit down. I was totally black and blue. I think that's why I like that Zen proverb. Let go (laughs) or be dragged and hurt, and hurt. Attachment, first service didn't get that story. (laughs) Attachment is about this idea of recognizing when it is time to let go. And how do we know when it's time to let go? I think there are plenty of signals. We know if we are attaching to something instead of just being connected to it or preferring it. We know if we're attaching to something by what happens when that something doesn't unfold the way we wanted it to. If we have a resistant, angry, defensive, critical energy around it, then we were holding on with all our might. We were attaching to it. When we have a preference, when things don't unfold the way that we had planned for them to unfold, We may be momentarily disappointed, but we do pick ourselves back up. We open ourselves to the field of infinite possibilities, and we move forward. There's a grace and an ease. There's an effortless effort that begins to kick in. Chopra, in this chapter, also suggests to us that we need to get comfortable with this idea of uncertainty and with this the challenge of seeking security. And this is how he words it. He says, the search for security is an illusion. In ancient wisdom traditions, the solution to this whole dilemma lies in the wisdom of insecurity or the wisdom of uncertainty. This means that the search for security and certainty is actually an attachment to the known. And what's the known? The known is our past. The known is nothing other than the prison of past conditioning. 
There's no evolution in that, absolutely none at all. And when there is no evolution, he writes, there is stagnation, entropy, disorder, and decay. And so then the invitation to us is to step into the unknown, to step into the fertile ground of pure potentiality, to step into something that is open, to step into something that is infinite. But to do that, we need to let go. We need to let go. We need to let go of what was. We need to let go of what was known. We need to let go of what is familiar in order to step into that emerging field of what is possible for us. And when we're talking about creating greater success in our lives, which is what this book is dedicated to, we're talking about doing that in a different way, in, in a non-traditional way, if you will. Not in the way of relentless hard work and a driven, stressful energy and attitude, but in a way that has preferences, in a way that sets an intention for that which we desire, but is also open to those desires being fulfilled through many different uh, through many different ways, through many different possibilities. He says that the law of detachment does not negate the law of intention and desire. He writes, you still have your goals, but you know with absolute certainty that between point A and B, there are infinite possibilities. With detachment, you might change direction in any moment and if you find a higher ideal. And you're also less likely to force solutions on problems while remaining open and alert to opportunities. Can you feel the different way of being that it is? It's not an either or. It's not that you don't have the intentions and desires for whatever you have your intentions and desires for, but you go about them inwardly and externally in a very different way. Have you ever watched a leaf flow down a stream? Have you ever watched? It's a very peaceful thing to watch. It flows with the water. It's carried with the water with effortless ease, right? Wu Wei, effortless effort. What if we really practice living our lives that way? It's not no effort, but it's effortless effort. What if those things that you hold near and dear that you want to bring forth in your life, you still held in your consciousness and in your heart and in your, your mind, but you were committed to doing with ease and grace? Do you think getting there would be even more enjoyable? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you think you would grow and evolve in the process? I know you would. I know you would. Deepak writes this about the process of evolution. He says, when your preparedness meets opportunity, the solution will spontaneously appear. What comes out of that is often called good luck. He says, but good luck is nothing but preparedness and opportunity coming together. When the two are mixed together with an alert witnessing of the chaos, a solution emerges that will be of evolutionary benefit to you and to all those that you come in contact with. This is the perfect recipe for success, and it's based on the law of detachment. I want to live like that. Do you want to live like that? I want to live like that. And so he gives us some very specific instructions on how to practice this. They're very simple to articulate, to actually do, takes quite a bit of discipline. But he says, number one, as you practice this law of detachment, realize that a piece of it is allowing others to be as they are without you forcing them to be as you think they should be. Boy, is that powerful. <laughs> Allow others to be as they are without you forcing them or loving them or praying them into. <laughs> See, we just spiritualize that whole thing. The way you want them to be. Let them be as they are. Let them be as they are. Secondly, he says, be willing to accept uncertainty, allowing 
what's possible to emerge out of the field of pure potentiality. Get comfortable, be willing to accept uncertainty. For some of us in this room, that's harder to do than others. For those of us in this room who are masters at organization and planning and on the Myers-Briggs personality temperament, R-A-J, I'm a 19 out of 20 on the J scale, this is not so easy. It does not come naturally. And those of you for whom this does come naturally, trust me, there are other things for you that don't come naturally. <laughs> my lessons are not your lessons. Your lessons are not my lessons, right? Isn't that good? I mean, would you want everybody on the planet having to learn the same lessons that you are? Oh, you, that was a wimpy no. <laughs> no, we are meant to be uniquely ourselves. And that means not just with the talents and gifts that we have, but we're unique with the problems that we have and how we go about solving them and, and what kind of buttons we have and what gets pushed by whom and when and where and why and how, and that's a whole other lesson. So be willing to accept uncertainty, allowing solutions to emerge, he says. And the third way to practice, he says, is remain open to an infinity of choices. Remain open to an infinity of choices. So you can be clear, you want to be clear, on what it is that you intend, on what it is that you desire. You want to be clear about that, not attached to it, not hooked by it, clear and connected to it, while at the same time remaining open to the many different ways that that can come about and come to you. God bless you and namaste. All righty.